Welcome to our final episode, everyone. Um, if you've liked it and found it useful thus far, please hit like, subscribe if you've not done so already. Hit the notification bell for other episodes. I fear this is likely to be one that we're in for the long haul. I'm going to give you here some examples of student responses to the 2019 exam. Two A star responses, one A grade, a B plus, a strong B, a secure B, a strong C, a D, and a B from the prior year. So the theme question in 2019 was, explore Shakespeare's presentation of the theme of reputation in Othello. You must relate your discussion to relevant contextual factors and ideas from your critical reading. I was thrilled to bits with this question because I'd anticipated it and given it as a practice go optionally. And unfortunately, only one of the eight students that year opted for the reputation question, annoyingly, but never mind. Um, the upsetting thing was that nobody had quoted Iago saying that reputation was an idle and false imposition. But again, never mind. Um, the character question that year was the presentation of Amelia. I'd forbidden them from doing such a thing. One did, and I've not included that example here. Um, that one was unfortunately a, a, a D grade. Although B in prose and elsewhere. The 2019 boundaries out of 60 for this paper. So we're combining here the Shakespeare question with the modern play question. In the case of my class, Streetcar Named Desire. 42 out of 60 got you an A star. 38 was an A. 32 was a B. 27 was a C. 22 was a D. I feel like I just need to clarify that. In 2019, I gave a practice question optionally for reputation, and out of a class of eight, only one opted to actually draft a reputation response as preparation. Um, in actuality, seven out of the eight picked this question, and one opted for the Amelia question. Interestingly, the one who had done a practice on reputation was one of the A-star candidates and the grade out of 35, the number out of 35 that I gave her in the practice was only one removed, I can't remember which way, from her eventual outcome. So it's all in the preparation. So I did some three years ago gain permission from these students to use their material as exemplar stuff albeit in a classroom, not so much on this platform. So I hope that this will be OK. Um, this candidate on this paper got an A star and she achieved, uh, I can't remember what the overall score was. I can't remember who it is without looking at it. Um, 16 out of 21 for assessment objectives 1, 2 and 3 and 11 out of 14 for assessment objective five gave her a 27 out of 35. And at 45 out of 60, her paper was an A star. Throughout Othello, Shakespeare appears to present an intrinsic link between reputation and identity. So she makes this connection straight away as part of her argument. As a solid identity, things like race, appears to be produced as a byproduct of good reputation, as Cassio notoriously highlights. However, Shakespeare also appears to present how tenuous reputation can be and how it can be easily lost and gained. An idle and false imposition oft lost without merit and got without deserving as most evidently portrayed through the characters of Othello, Desdemona and Cassio. A good introduction. Initially in the play, however, Othello is presented as having a seemingly solid reputation as this masculine, strong general, 
with a marriage to an idyllic woman for the Jacobean society of the time in the form of Desdemona, with her beauty, wit and fortunes. It thus seems significant that Othello's reputation and thus identity only begin to break down in Othello generating self-doubt and thus jealousy over Desdemona's alleged affair, significantly with a white man. It appears Othello's self-doubt over his wife's loyalty stems from his concerns of being a black man in essentially a white supremist society. That's the, the bit that I would disagree with. Uh, I think this candidate is thinking about white supremacists as in the idea of neo-Nazis or skinheads. Uh, not, not an accurately applied term here. I do recall now uh, that this was the candidate who had done a practice question on reputation and I had given that a 28 out of 35, which was, I think, just tweaking it into A-star. This paper was A-star. I think her coursework was A-grade. I think her prose paper was also an A-grade. She did, I now recall, definitely get an A overall. Her prose question, I think, was an A. There's an example of it on the Handmaid's course, so I'll, we'll be able to verify thereafter. Feminist critic Bonnie Greer were bringing in not only a critic, but talking about her school of criticism, marks this as a mere coincidence and emphasises it as merely pure jealousy rather than racial doubt, as the trait of which undermines his life. It is that of which is a part of the man himself. It is clear within the play, jealousy is Othello's overriding emotion, and that drives his murderous actions. However, it seems significant for Othello to announce, haply for I am black, and have not these soft parts of conversation that chamberers have. This candidate uses a critic and goes on to find further evidence. So we are exploring at this stage in terms of the mark scheme. After the alleged affair is revealed, it seems ironic for Othello to highlight his difficulty with language, especially considering his previous well-spoken rhetoric. The terminology is good, AO1, as is the argument. However, what appears of more significance is his self-referential racism. You can tell that they've been taught by me. As a minority figure, Othello is isolated within this society by the characters who consider their race as supreme, I'm not keen on that term, as white men. This appears particularly in the case of Iago, in his exclamation to Brabantio how an old black ram is topping your white you. The zoomorphic reference to Othello as a black ram connotes wild and bestial, whilst white you, in reference to Desdemona, connotes youthful and innocent. It is clear of Iago's resentment of Othello, most likely stemming from racial ideologies and he utilised it in order to anger Brabantio due to the common view that black men were the inferior race in this society. Um, so actually what this candidate now is doing is refuting Greer's remark that it's simply about jealousy. Uh, as opposed to racial doubt. Othello is also commonly addressed as the Moor, isolating him further in society in its connotations of inferiority and unique. I have typed out or dictated these answers just as they were written grammatically by the students. So if there are errors there, it's to accurately represent what the student response and quality was like. However, Othello appears unaffected by these comments until the revelation of the alleged affair. 
As O'Toole highlights, it is Othello's sense of inferiority as a black man in a white society that validates Desdemona's affair with the noble Cassio, because he believes himself to be inferior to Cassio due to his race, and he is not just acting on pure jealousy, as Greer proposes. Othello appears to view his reputation as in danger due to Desdemona's actions as presenting him as a weak, cuckolded man, and it is already rather unstable despite his attempts to portray otherwise due to his race, driving Othello's later actions in the play. Othello is the cause of his own downfall. Perhaps the most saddening loss of reputation Shakespeare presents is that of Desdemona's. Desdemona, as a married woman in Jacobean society, is thus viewed as her husband's property. Hence why her reputation and thus identity appear so heavily interlinked with his opinion of her. When Othello believes Desdemona to be the pure, loyal wife he married before the revelation of the alleged affair, he appears to bolster Desdemona's identity to be at one with his. This is emphasised through Othello's use of my fair warrior to address Desdemona, to which she responds, my dear Othello. Not only does this use of epithet, uh, I think the uh, my colleague this year would have been teaching the poetry and talking about transferred epithets and some of my candidates have, have tried to apply it here in a way that isn't working for me. And shared lines appear to emphasise their harmonious marriage, but also highlights his high opinion of her. This is due to Othello's use of warrior generating ideas of warfare and power, typically masculine attributes. Othello appears to view Desdemona as his equal in their harmonious marriage. They truly appear as the perfect romantic couple. However, this also demonstrates how Desdemona's reputation hinges upon his opinion of her and thus of her chastity through the possessive pronoun my. This connotes ownership and emphasises Othello's dominance of her character in his possession of her. Desdemona's identity is not her own. Throughout the play, Desdemona's character appears to portray the trait, as Mrs Jameson emphasises it to be, of gentleness verging on passiveness. However, Due to Desdemona's initial presentation of a strong-willed, intuitive character, any passiveness can be viewed in her character does not appear a natural trait. Instead, this passiveness could be viewed as a product of Othello's tearing down of Desdemona's identity in the ruining of her reputation. This candidate refines the critical position. Othello proceeds to call Desdemona strumpet and that cunning whore of Venice, obvious insults that connote promiscuity and disloyalty that highly contrast the pure Desdemona, reducing her character to simply her sexuality and Venetian background. Subtly bringing in AO3 context, we could probably do with some of the contemporary stereotypes being made more clear there. But AO3 is there. It was a common... No, I'm sorry, AO3 is made much more clear in the next sentence. It was a common occurrence for English writers in the Jacobean era to portray a liberal Venice for a symbol of promiscuity and cuckoldry, evidently what Othello has come to expect of Desdemona's character brilliantly, eloquently, efficiently integrated AO5 and AO3. You'll start to note the length and development of this response as well. There's plenty of it in the time. However, it can appear almost maddening to a modern audience to watch Desdemona conform to become this passive two-dimensional character as Othello destroys her individualism in the destruction of her reputation. 
This is particularly evident in Desdemona's repeated cries of, My Lord, during her murder. Lord carries connotations of power and dominance. Desdemona allows Othello to dominate her character despite societally, socially, even through the destruction of her divine reputation, she is still more desirable as a white figure than Othello himself. This is because of their marriage, because in their marriage her identity has become heavily interlinked with Othello's and thus his opinion of her. He can elevate her character, such as seen in Sweet Desdemona, with Sweet connoting innocence and purity, or destroy it in his insults. Desdemona loses her identity in the loss of her reputation and thus conforms to become the passive loyal wife in an attempt to salvage her reputation by emphasising her loyalty further to Othello. Perhaps the most significant loss of reputation presented in the play is that of Michael Cassio's. This is emphasised in Cassio's cries after his bestial actions of Oh, my reputation, I have lost the immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. For Cassio to compare his reputation to being the immortal part of myself highlights its importance. Immortal connotes ethereal continuity. It is what is remembered about a character after physical death. Hence, Cassio's distraught reaction to losing it. However, Cassio's character also highlights the subjective nature of reputation and the ease of both gain and loss of it. Cassio goes from one of the most disgraced characters in the play, as Othello dismisses him to nevermore be officer of mine, to one of the most powerful within a matter of a few scenes, as Lodovico announces Cassio rules in Cyprus. This emphasises the tenuous nature of reputation, as Spencer highlights both of them, Othello and Cassio, lose it, reputation, at several moments and through different methods in the play. However, what Spencer doesn't highlight is Cassio is the only character to regain his reputation and even benefit further from it in the play. This candidate again picks something that she can refine and refute and build upon. We are evaluating and sustaining a clear engagement with the critics. This also highlights the subjective nature of reputation. Note the range of critics as well. There's a good number of them. Iago, for example, condemns Cassio's reputation, explaining how he has, he is a mere bookish theoric with no more knowledge than a spinster. Cassio, although at a higher ranking than Iago himself, appears innocent and foolish. Iago appears to believe although he may be driven by a motiveless malignity, as Coleridge states in his opinion, his reputation is far more superior, even incomparable to Cassio's, despite Othello's continued praise of him as a fine Venetian. Iago manipulates his reputation in the presence of Rodrigo to highlight his superior nature. Reputation is merely subjective. Overall, Shakespeare appears to present the notion of reputation and identity being interlinked and controlled by some other superior factor. Othello, for example, controls the reputation of Desdemona, and even to an extent Cassio's before his character's downfall. And Othello's is controlled by his racial self-doubt generated by the Jacobean society as presented in the play. A fantastic answer, fantastically handling critics and context, really well and eloquently uh, and quite economically argued. This paper for this candidate was an A star. Their overall score was an A. 
a pattern that I have discerned across most candidates across most years has been the weakest grading exam wise being the prose paper by roughly a grade. In the drama paper, I have found that students tend to do better in the Shakespeare than the modern play, whether that's because Shakespeare is section A and they spend a longer hour and a quarter than the contemporary play is possible, especially because of the importance of bringing in AO5 or the critics. So the last candidate was an A star in her drama paper and an A overall. In the same way, this candidate also was A star in the drama paper and A overall. I think the other candidate was an A in prose and this candidate was a B in prose. All roads lead to Rome, things add up. 17 out of 21 for assessment objectives one, two and three. Argument, close analysis and context. Other critics, 11 out of 14, 28 out of 35 against the last candidate being 27. They both got 45 out of 60, a star for drama. The theme of reputation in Othello could be perceived as an analogous with the theme of identity. The titular character Othello remain, maintains his reputation as a great soldier and military general. His strong sense of masculinity is what constitutes a large part of his identity. However, the racist attitudes of the Jacobean society of the 17th century in which Shakespeare wrote Othello are reflected in the play by characters such as Iago, directed toward the Moor Othello. Racism corrodes his own sense of identity and thus leaves his own perception of his reputation. He begins to employ self-referential racism, showing how he feels his race decreases the value of his reputation. The women in the play suffer an assault on their reputation. Accusations of sexual promiscuity tarnish their reputation in the eyes of others, ultimately causing the murder of Desdemona at the end. Othello views himself as a successful soldier and commands respect for his reputable military prowess from characters such as the Duke. His military skill boosts the sense of masculinity that makes up part of his identity. And Othello prides himself on his reputation as a man's man. In the first scene, Othello references the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed from year to year and this conveys his strong sense of masculinity. The phrase from year to year suggests a long period of time and a sense of continuity, as if to show his strength and military skill persists to the present day. The asyndetic listing of battles, sieges, fortunes conveys a sense of excess, highlighting the number of challenges and battles he has survived and won, and further emphasising his strong feeling of masculinity which constitutes his identity and consequently his reputation. Othello is set in the backdrop of the Venetian and Turkish conflicts of the 17th century and Othello's insinuation of taking part in numerous battles could allude to his success as a Venetian military general in this war, emphasising his pride in defeating forces of the Ottoman Empire, strengthening his sense of masculinity. However, Othello is viewed as an alien in the predominantly white society of Venice, and so several characters within the play exhibit racist attitudes toward him as a black man, the most notable being Iago. Iago arguably exploits Othello's racial insecurity in order to destroy his sense of identity, and thus reputation, so that he can gain revenge on him for allegedly sleeping with his wife. Shakespeare utilises his black and white imagery to highlight the difference in race between Othello and Desdemona, possibly highlighting his racist attitude toward him. Iago crudely remarks, an old black ram is topping your white you. 
The references to black and white are relatively explicit references to the colour of Othello's skin. But the animalistic connotations of Ram and you on one level suggest a sense of crudity on Iago's part, as it seems a graphically sexual reference. On another level, it could be a reference to the racist attitudes of the 17th century Jacobean society, as if Shakespeare uses Iago as a vehicle to highlight the inherent racism of society. In the 17th century, the slave trade was rife in Europe, and many people used racist and misogynistic attitudes to justify such things taking place. Minority groups such as Jews and Moors in society were looked down upon as evil and inhuman, almost as animals, and perhaps this societal attitude is what Shakespeare is alluding to through his use of the animalistic metaphor. He is attempting to make Othello's reputation one of animal rather than great soldier. I was just starting to worry about this critic's lack of AO3 and AO5. Perhaps we could have talked about the medieval chain of being at the end of that last point, but critics are coming in at this point. Some critics argue that Iago speaks about Othello in such a way as to exert revenge for him allegedly cuckolding him with his wife Amelia, as opposed to destroying his reputation based solely on racial hatred. Greer, however, argues that jealousy is what causes Othello's identity to become corrupt, not racism, although that plays a part not the unmotivated hatred of Iago. I would argue that Othello's jealousy is ultimately his homartia, which leads to his downfall at the end. But it is, in fact, the corrosive effect of racist hatred from society and Iago, which leaves him psychologically vulnerable to the evil machinations of Iago, who wants revenge on Othello, and his reputation for cuckolding him, and leads him down a path of self-destruction to do so. This very much refines the critical position well done. In fact, O'Toole states that racism isn't just part of the context in which Othello lives, it has entered his mind and soul. We're pitting one critic against another, well done. It is an integral part of his... Uh, of him, the outside world which he carries around in his most intimate and private self. This supports the notion that racist attitudes ultimately lead to Othello's downfall as they caused the heart of his identity to become corrupt and the self-destruction of his own reputation. Really engaging with critics in a, a, a high calibre way. It could be argued that Othello demonstrates a concept of political activism. W.E.B. Dubois, a double consciousness, this sense of seeing oneself through the eyes of others. Primarily, Othello takes pride in his masculinity and military success, but also sees himself in a racist way as a result of other people, like Iago's, perceptions of him. He highlights this when he laments, for I am black and have not these soft parts of conversation. Soft, in this context, connotes a sense of eloquence. Really well done. As if Othello believes his race makes him less articulate and socially acceptable. Very eloquently put, yourself. The self-referential racism that he demonstrates is what corrodes him and his identity. I love that phrasing of corrodes leading to the ruining of his reputation. The women in the play, most disturbingly Desdemona, suffer substantial defamation of their reputation in the play. Jardine notes that all three women face charges of sexual promiscuity, the most readily available form of assault on a woman's reputation. This is most reflected by Desdemona through the play, initially presented in a virginal light as divine Desdemona. Divine connotes a sense of holiness and virtuousness. 
showing how Desdemona was considered to be reputable and respected as a pure woman. However, after Iago villainously plants seeds of doubt surrounding Desdemona's sexual promiscuity, which was largely expected of the average lewd and wicked woman of 17th century Venice, she is labelled the cunning whore of Venice. Brilliant. That might more clearly talk about stereotypes of Venice at the time, but it is very uh, economically doing something uh, as a race against the timing of the exam. And brilliantly done. Whore is a stark, offensive contrast to that of purity. And as a result of this false accusation of infidelity against her by a man, she loses her reputation and consequently her life. In conclusion, Shakespeare intertwines the theme of identity with that of reputation to show how masculinity constitutes Othello's reputation as a great military leader, but also how the inherent racism of the 17th century society as a result of the slave trade and the dominant Ottoman Empire corrupted his sense of identity at the hands of Iago and led him to destroy his own reputation. There's a little bit of panicked shoehorning in of history there. Similarly, it can be seen how misogynistic attitudes toward women and sexual promiscuity caused the downfall of Desdemona and destruction of her reputation. I am really, really proud of this response, as should be the candidate. A star in drama, A overall. So this next candidate was consistently an A in all elements and therefore A overall. This drama paper at 41 out of 60, had it been a Mark Moore, would have been into A star. 15 out of 21 for argument, analysis, context. 9 out of 14 for other critics. 24 out of 35. The prior year's question had been identity, and I think I'd been talking about identity and reputation as being synonymous. Hence, the, the last three candidates have all made a very similar opening argument. In Shakespeare's Othello, reputation is presented as an integral part of the identity of many characters throughout the play. A noble reputation which Othello the noble Moor possesses as a result of his distinguished military service, allows him to ascend to social rankings where usually his status as both a Moor and previous Muslim would have denied him. Yet conversely, a soiled reputation leads to the downfall of both Cassio, although it is regained at the play's denouement, and Desdemona, who Graham Greene remarks is killed for being a whore, but dies a virgin. Throughout his play, William Shakespeare emphasises both the constructive and destructive properties of reputation and how it remains a core aspect of the character's identities, an eloquent and independent argument. In the initial scene of the play, Iago and Rodrigo paint to the audience an image of Othello in which he is a foolish master who has chosen a great arithmetician to be his lieutenant instead of Iago, who has been tested in battle at Rhodes, Cyprus and on other grounds. This would immediately cause a contemporary audience to adopt a negative outlook toward Othello, an outlook bolstered by the use of more and thick lips, which is evocative of Shakespeare's other more characters, such as the evil Aaron the Moor in Titus Andronicus. Genre and intertextuality is a really good and valid form of AO3 context. However, when Othello finally takes to the stage, he exhibits a character incongruous with Iago's description as his sophisticated and poetic language, keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them, subverts the audience's expectation of a savage Moor character. Brilliant. It is here that Othello shows how his distinguished reputation 
has the power to change the perception of his power to others. When told of the coming of Brabantio's men, Othello tells Iago, let him do his spite. My services, which I have done the signatory, shall out-tongue his complaints. Othello firmly believes that his reputation as a general will overcome Brabantio's racist fears of a black ram topping his daughter. Othello expresses this notion further, saying that my parts, my title and my perfect soul shall manifest me nightly or rightly. Othello sees his perfect soul, his reputation, as being capable of overcoming the racist and negative views of him put forward by Iago, Rodrigo and Brabantio. This belief is confirmed at the end of Act 1, when the Duke attempts to comfort Brabantio with the rhyming couplet If virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. This couplet, given emphasis by its inclusion in standard prose dialogue, I'm not sure if that's accurate, reinforces Othello's conviction that his perfect reputation can overcome the racist stereotypes attributed to his identity. The line far more, far more fair than black is evocative of contemporary Elizabethan beliefs that fair white skin was indicative of goodness and purity, whilst the black skin of Othello's character would be associated with evil and the devil. Othello's description as being more fair than black, suggests his honorary inclusion into the upper ranks of a white Eurocentric society. Othello's pristine reputation allows his character to be considered an other to thrive in Venetian society. Reputation is also presented as a core aspect of identity, Although in some characters such as Iago and Desdemona, discord exists between the reputation assigned to a character by society and their true human nature. Iago is a prime example of this. His character exhibits a complex dichotomy of his reputation, that of the trustworthy and honest Iago, and his true manipulative character driven by motiveless malignity. Coleridge. The honest epithet is attached to Iago throughout almost the entire play to reaffirm his good reputation to the audience and other characters. Yet, at the same time, through his actions and asides, his villainous identity is articulated. He evokes the imagery of Helen Knight that must bring this monstrous birth to the world's light, in his aside at the end of Act 1, to reveal his plans. His association with Helen Knight, despite his fair skin, produces an inversion of the racist views toward Othello and his true noble character. Shakespeare represents reputation as a perception that can be accurate, such as Othello's appropriate reputation that will manifest him knightly, or can be a distinct opposite to the person it is associated with. Iago boasts the reputation of being honest, but lies and manipulates throughout the entire play. Shakespeare emphasises this discord between reputation and one's true character through the female characters in Othello, but mainly through Desdemona. Bianca is labelled trash by Iago and becomes a source of humour during the locker room vernacular, Stevens, shared by Iago and Cassio due to her intentions of marrying the latter. However, her reputation as a prostitute ensures that Cassio will never marry her, despite her apparently truly loving him. In Othello, the reputations of women are assigned by the patriarchal society of Venice. Initially, this serves Desdemona well. She is considered an unearthly paragon, Turnbull, amongst other women, and has been placed on a pedestal by the men who worship her, 
Ryan. However, after Iago convinces Othello through the ocular proof of the handkerchief that his wife is an adulteress, not adulteress, her reputation is forever tarnished. Desdemona being branded as the whore of Venice by her husband and ultimately being killed for her undeserved reputation potentially highlights Shakespeare's different views on the reputations of men and women. In the play, Cassio loses his reputation, the immortal part of himself, which he compares to a soul as all that remains is bestial. Yet by the end, Cassio's reputation is restored through his appointment to governor of Cyprus. Likewise, after murdering his wife, Othello attempts to salvage his lost reputation by reminding the audience that he has done the state some service. Although F.R. Levis sees this final speech as a pathetic self-dramatisation to garner sympathy, A.C. Bradley claims that the admission of guilt in his speech elevates Othello to the status of a tragic hero. I'm glad to be reading that bit because so far I think this third candidate who is on an A+, is actually making a stronger independent argument than the two prior A-star candidates, but so far hasn't done anything particularly evaluative, merely citing critics. But he's starting to pitch one critic against another here. To some extent at least, Othello's reputation and honour is restored. However, the women in the play who are subject to the male perception of them, do not retain their reputation or their lives. Graham Greene writes that what separates Amelia and Desdemona from a strumpet like Bianca is not their appearance, nor class, nor even sexual behaviour, but their reputation, the label that they are given by society. Really good. The women's reputations are subject to the perception of male characters. Once their reputation is spoiled, the women suffer. In Othello, Shakespeare portrays the power of reputation in Venetian society. Othello's perfect soul and reputation allow him to join the ranks of Venetian nobility despite his original religion and skin colour. However, reputation is also presented as not always being accurately assigned to a character, as is the case for Iago and Desdemona. Yet Shakespeare also presents a difference between the reputation of men and women. Men like Cassio and Othello are able to salvage their reputation, whilst Desdemona, Emilia and Bianca suffer from the immutable reputation assigned to them by the patriarchy. Eloquent stuff. The difference in reputation potentially reflects the hypocritical attitude toward the behaviour of men and women in the Elizabethan, I'd argue, Jacobean era. A man could regain his reputation through deeds, whilst women, who were expected to be passive and remain in the household, would be forced to live with the label imposed on her by society. A very strong A+. So this was a 36 out of 60, a B+, a very strong B, where 38 was the A boundary. Uh, I think this candidate, if it's the one I'm thinking of, was a dramatist uh, who got an A in her prose paper and a B overall. 10 out of 21 for argument and close analysis and context. 8 out of 14 for use of other critics. 18 out of 35. Shakespeare presents reputation as a key theme in Othello, as the characters are predominantly high status and therefore have valuable reputations that some of which are arguably inevitably to be lost in the tragedy. The theme of race is vital when exploring reputation within the play, as Othello's colour 
greatly hinders his reputation both with both himself and others. From the play's opening through to the final scene, racial slurs are proffered abundantly. Yargo often uses these slurs in order to psychologically worsen others' opinions of Othello by using zoomorphism and dysphemism to make Othello appear crude and animalistic. An example of this is in Act 1, Scene 1, when Yargo says to Brabantio, an old black ram is tupping your white you. They've all remembered the rude bits, as usual. Yargo makes reference to race here with the statement of black and white, whilst also using zoomorphism when referring to Othello as a ram. He also employs zoomorphism when referring to Desdemona as a you, by this, in, in this sense connoting purity, youth and innocence, to make the old black ram appear even more incongruous. It might be nice if, as a measure of AO3 historic context, they looked at the association of a goat, a ram, and lascivious excessive sexual appetite. 19th century critic Coleridge interprets that it would be something monstrous to conceive this beautiful Venetian girl falling in love with a veritable Negro. Coleridge, a 19th century critic, appears swayed by the fact that there was still a large amount of social stigma surrounding people of colour at that time. Desdemona's love is repeatedly proven to be true, and Shakespeare was unlikely to have considered himself monstrous for creating this plot. The interpretation of Professor Jonathan Dollimore appears much more viable in this respect, as he states that Desdemona's love for Othello and his for her are inflected with racial idealizations. Each romanticizes the difference of the other as a means of escaping the limitations of their own lives. This is being done really well. He suggests that Desdemona and Othello have strong love for each other, but an aspect of this love stems from their racial differences as they both view each other as exotic and beyond the bounds of their ordinary lives. To Desdemona, there would have been a strong element of danger surrounding Othello, as there would have been for Shakespeare's associations with witchcraft. Much of this was reinforced by King James' belief in the supernatural, explained in his book entitled Demonology, or Daemonology. This also ties in with Brabantio's accusations of Othello in Act 1, Scene 3, stating she is abused, corrupted by spells and medicines, bought of mountebanks, for nature so preposterously to err, being not deficient, blind or lame of sense, sans witchcraft could not. Brabantio is shown to believe that Desdemona could only have been drawn to marriage with Othello by witchcraft. This matches the interpretation of President John Quincy Adams, who states that marriage between Othello and Desdemona is ill-assorted, clandestine and unnatural. The reputation of Desdemona is destroyed throughout the play, as she is accused of being, and subsequently is strongly believed to be, a strumpet. The critic F. R. Levis said, we should see in Iago's prompt success not Iago's diabolical intellect, but Othello's readiness to respond. Othello is so easily convinced of Desdemona's unfaithfulness that it appears he expected it of her. This may in part be due to Desdemona's incongruency with expectations of women in the Elizabethan and Jacobean eras. Women were expected to be subservient to their fathers and husbands, but Brabantio warns Othello in Act 1, Scene 3, Look to her more, if thou hast eyes to see. She hath deceived her father, and may thee. The use of a rhyming couplet here implies Brabantio's certainty in the warning. Additionally, Iago refers to Desdemona as our captain's captain, suggesting Iago is satirising 
the fact that Desdemona is clearly far less than subservient to Othello. Desdemona is afforded a plethora of insults, most notably that cunning whore of Venice said by Othello. However, Desdemona's loss of reputation is entirely unjust, as she is never unfaithful. Critic Sarah Robertson interprets... I do not think Shakespeare agreed with the male attitude to women portrayed in this play. He seems to mark them as everything the men say about the women is completely untrue. Most likely, Shakespeare did disagree with his own portrayals, using the negative opinions of the men to show their own faults of character as opposed to the flaws of women. Alternatively, and rather more morbidly, it could be interpreted Shakespeare believed these portrayals and intended this play as a warning to women to marry within their social class so as to avoid meeting Desdemona's fate. Showing here uh, an awareness and interpretation of multiple possible readings, and well done for it. Yago's reputation although not as high as several others at the play's beginnings, is arguably the strongest built and therefore the hardest to break. Throughout the play, he is continually referred to as Honest Yargo, showing he has convinced all that he is trustworthy. In Act 1, Scene 1, he divulges plans to Rodrigo, stating, I follow him to serve my turn upon him. Others there are who, trimmed with visages, masks of beauty, uh, duty that should say, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves. This shows Iago's true intentions to the audience right at the beginning of the play, which creates a strong sense of dramatic irony as Iago is constantly referred to as honest. Critic Vinton O'Toole interprets that the audience becomes complicit in Iago's manipulation, and like it or not, are soon involved in his plotting. He actually asked them what he should do. It's clear that Iago's plotting is central to the play, as he divulges his plans directly to the audience in the form of many soliloquies. He takes the form of a true Machiavellian villain, and involves the audience so deeply in his plotting that they can never achieve catharsis as he isn't directly punished. Mm, okay. His punishment is brought down at the very conclusion of the play and the audience are not shown to what extent. In conclusion, Shakespeare explores the theme of reputation through loss of it. The characters lose reputation, forming the basis for the tragic element of the play. The involvement of race and gender in this theme is vital in creating and destroying the reputation of both Desdemona and Othello, while Iago's reputation is built from deception. B plus, a really, really good response, but notice in terms of length, it's shorter, perhaps a bit less developed than those that were at A and A star. This candidate's overall outcome was unfortunate in that they had a B overall from a B-grade drama paper, a prose paper that was very erroneously marked. I understand that the E-grade was definitely in inaccurate, but I, I can see how perhaps it was uh, an imbalanced conveying of the two novels. Um, but it really was better than what it got. Uh, her coursework was A star. I think poetry was A or A star. I can't remember. It was a B overall. This paper for drama was 35 out of 60, B grade. 14 out of 21 for AO123. 10 out of 14 for critics. 24 out of 35. The theme of reputation in Shakespeare's Othello is shown to be a crucial part of the character's public identities, regardless of whether such presentations are representative of their true person personality. 
Not only does the playwright show the importance of reputation through Cassio's circumstances, but also through the arc of the titular hero, with his behavioural developments and the importance of female reputation conveyed in the contemporary setting. Shakespeare presents reputation as being vital to social survival in the 16th century, most clearly through the character of Cassio. Once held in high esteem by Othello, with Cassio acting as his trusted lieutenant, much to Iago's annoyance, he falls from grace after becoming involved in a drunken brawl with Rodrigo and soon after loses his reputation, uh, position. Upon such change in his status, he exclaims to Iago, reputation, 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 oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. Repetition of the noun reputation particularly serves to emphasise the importance further shown through his description of it as the immortal part of myself, which introduces the idea that one's reputation and the public perception of a person will live on beyond that person themselves in the form of memory. As such, Cassio fears that memory of this violent incident will remain forever, and his once valiant reputation in Desdemona's words is now lost, never to be regained. What's more, by saying that as a result of his fight, what remains is bestial, he references the Elizabethan notion of the chain of being, a hierarchy of all living things in which men placed above women and animals for their superior intellect and sense of reason. Having abandoned this intellect and reason when he became drunk, and having lost his good reputation as a result and a consequence, Cassio feels that he has descended the chain and fallen inhuman and even living estimation to become nothing more than bestial, savage and barbaric, and, this might be improved by saying, unable to ascend to heaven. Perhaps there's also a slight tendency here to a need to avoid being slightly narrative, but that's perhaps a slightly churlish uh, criticism when quotations and analysis is also very, very well embedded. Othello, too, is shown to give into his bestial characteristics, as was the stereotyped behaviour of black-skinned people in the latter half of the play, following Iago's revelation of Desdemona's affair in Act 3, Scene 3. As a result, he too loses his noble reputation. At the end of the aforementioned scene, the hero seems to adopt Iago's language of animalistic and black and white imagery, both in his speech and his behaviour. For example, when he exclaims, Arise, black vengeance from thy hollow cell. Violent exclamations replacing his previously composed and eloquent speech. In this way, and through his ruthless treatment of others from the temptation scene onward, particularly of Desdemona, Othello seems to fulfil critic Nevo's interpretation of a hero as being a person of sensual and vindictive nature. This view almost directly contradicts that of A.C. Bradley, who maintains Othello's perfect noble character and reputation, describing him as being not of this world. I'm not sure what that pitting of the two together is necessarily doing analytically. Nevertheless, the decline of the character's reputation cannot be denied, as is summarised with Lodovico's comment after... Othello has murdered Desdemona. O oh, thou Othello that once was so good, fallen in the practice of a damned slave. In saying so, Lodovico highlights how Shakespeare presents reputation as being linked to race, 
through the character of Othello. By the end of the play, the hero has fulfilled many of the contemporary racial stereotypes of black people as violent and vindictive as Nebo has written, which can be seen in ironic contrast to the Duke's early comment after Othello has pleaded his case for marrying Desdemona. If virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. This line shows the racial perceptions of a time in which character was thought to be determined by skin colour, but also how seriously Othello's reputation has disintegrated when he was once so trustworthy and noble, as Bradley maintains. Critical use being a little bit clunkier here, I think. I will take this opportunity, not that it's because of this particular candidate, but just in general, of noting from my prior lesson material how much emphasis I have placed on really precise imagery that wasn't necessarily utilised as much by this cohort. Most recently, I taught Othello for GCSE level, for the Cambridge IGCSE, inside the last academic year. And I made a a much greater emphasis on that imagery for the purposes of that. Bring in the useful symbolism for close AO2 as you go and integrate into your AO1 argument along with being more evaluative of critics and contexts. All of these things need to be integrated together. Not a criticism of this particular candidate in particular, just something that occurs to me at this point as I'm listening and recording. Jardine has written that all three women, though unequal in rank and power, are equally vulnerable to a sexual charge brought against them. And this is certainly shown to be true in the case of Desdemona. Once hailed as the divine Desdemona by Cassio, for her purity and angelic qualities, the idea further emphasised when Othello exclaims, if she be false in heaven, do but mock itself. Shakespeare presents a dichotomy between these earlier descriptions and those later by Othello, who accuses Desdemona of being a lewd minx and that cunning whore of Venice. As such, The sexual charge Othello brings against her, as a result of Iago's manipulation, causes the fall of her reputation, one that she is helpless to as it is dictated by men. Honigman interprets Desdemona as being the most heroic, noblest character a status which she arguably achieves through her guiltless death, despite accusations of adultery. She maintains her angelic reputation by dying to achieve tragic status. A B grade. I was really proud of this candidate getting a C plus in the drama paper, Uh, and indeed in a very unusual way in that he spent a really long time on the Shakespeare question and then actually only got a single figures response in the the modern play, unfortunately. Uh, But he did get a C overall. 31 out of 60 was a C on this paper. The argument, close analysis and context was 15 out of 21. The use of other critical interpretations, 10 out of 14 giving 25 out of 35. In Shakespeare's tragedy Othello, there are many themes. Not the most stonking introduction. Arguably the most important being reputation. It is represented in many different ways. Not the greatest introduction. One of which being social reputation. The concept is held in high regard for most characters. Characters hold their own individual reputation in very high regard. For example, Iago is seeking in Act 1, Scene 1, as Cassio has Iago seething in Act Act 1, Scene 1, 
as Cassio has been promoted over him. He, Cassio, has done my office. That's a, a misquotation from elsewhere about somebody else. However, more accurately, I know my price. I'm worth no worse a place. These quotations, the second one at least, clearly show that Iago is angered at Othello's decision. This idea could be reinforced by the fact that Iago, at this point, is speaking in prose. Uh, no, he's not actually. The informal speech may have been chosen by Shakespeare in order to connote anger and therefore presenting or portraying Iago's high regard for office or lack of. A little bit clunky, it's trying very hard with something that deserves to be awarded and merited, but is a bit inaccurate. Promotion to Othello's lieutenant can clearly meant uh, a lot to Iago, as it would have increased his reputation in Venetian society. This promotion was a direct link to reputation for Iago, and by having Iago lose to Cassio, Shakespeare is demonstrating that reputation is a large part of one's personality or life. Furthering the idea of reputation being immensely important to characters and a large part of their human personality, Cassio cries out in Act 2, Scene 3, Reputation! 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 Oh, I have lost my reputation! If you're still following these episodes, you will be sick of me saying that by now. Iago had persuaded Cassio to drink whilst on lookout for the enemy. Hopefully at least it inculcates it for you. The height of Cassio's drunken something is when he fights Montano. The lexical repetition of reputation could potentially show how important it is to Cassio. On top of this, Cassio goes on to claim, I have lost that immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. If only one of these candidates had carried on with Iago's response, it's idle and false, oft got without merit and lost without deserving. Cassio is not only claiming it is a large part of his reputation, something, instead an immortal part of his personality. Shakespeare is clearly signposting facts that reputation is immensely important to characters. When Iago references what remains is bestial, he has, without his reputation, dehumanised himself. Shakespeare could be showing how without reputation one may become no longer human. The theme of using bestial comparisons spans throughout the play. In Act 1, Scene 1, Iago says, Brabantio, says, of, says to Brabantio that an old black ram is tupping your white you. This imagery described by Iago could be an attempt to bear down Othello's reputation. The connotations of black at the time in Jacobean England were heavily associated with witchcraft and evil. The devil himself was said to be black. The overly sexual language could be key to constituting to Othello losing his reputation. The presentation of Othello as bestial could support this point. Othello's reputation is hampered as his most noticeable characteristic gives him away. He is black, therefore treated with incredible prejudice. For example, constantly referred to as the Moor. Another part of his reputation is that he has a fatal flaw. Othello's fatal flaw is jealousy. He carries it around with him like a crutch, waiting for someone to kick it out from under him. Fin to no tool. This is undeniably true, as Othello succumbs to the diabolical intellect of Iago. Fin to no tool. The jealousy sparked is all due to his evil machinations, or the evil machinations, A.C. Bradley of Iago. We're getting all of our critics in at once here and just using them. 
Yago's machinations end up getting Desdemona killed by her husband. However, even after the unearthly paragon, Turnbull, our critics here are being recalled, but not really engaged with and utilised, has been smothered by her husband. Othello is still obsessed with protecting his reputation. I have done the state some service. This suggests even after or during the murder of his sweetest, he is thinking of ways to protect his reputation. A good uh, analytical and argumentative point. Yargo's reputation is questionable to the audience throughout due to the aside speeches we, we are involved in his plan. This creates a sense of dramatic irony throughout it as until the murder scene when Amelia uncovers him for a traitor, Yargo is presented as an obsequious servant. Well, he is obsequious. He's not presented as obsequious. He's presented as loyal. Um, to his master and a Machiavellian villain at the same time. His reputation of mistrust is strengthened by his exclamation by Janus, Janus being the god of January or new beginnings, having two faces, very fitting for Iago. Tell us why. Because of his duplicity, as his reputation seems to be in two separate camps. The quote to support this, clunky, is, I am not what I am. The parallelism contained in this quote, please don't clunkily reference in this quote, or it should be quotation anyway, could support the point of his reputation as a lie and the honest Yargo being separate until the last scene. In conclusion, Shakespeare presents reputation as an overwhelming factor in the characters' lives. So much so that even in the war zone of Cyprus, expecting an attack from the Turks, quickly shoehorning some history in, it plays a huge role in their lives. It is presented as something when last it will dehumanise the victim, when lost. A C plus. Uh, and I think demonstrating what I was saying in episode 8 about the hierarchy of how to use versus engage with critics and how that maps onto grades. And I think that shows how accurately these guys have been marked. So this paper was at the very top of C grade through a really, really good Shakespeare response and actually a conversely very weak streetcar modern modern play response. Their prose was also a C. As ever, I can't remember what the poetry paper was, but I remember their coursework going in on the D grade. C overall. So this candidate was a D grade on their drama paper and a D overall, narrowly, just a couple of marks off a C. Uh, their coursework was a B grade. I I think their prose paper was a C. Uh, this was just narrowly missing C and, and getting D. I can't recall poetry, that wasn't my domain. But 24 out of 60, 9 out of 21 for argument, analysis and context, 5 out of 14 for other critics' interpretations, 14 out of 35. I did have another D grade example um, but that was somebody who didn't follow my advice and answered on Amelia rather than the theme question. So I thought I would skip that in favour of looking at uh, a former student from the year before and their B grade. In Shakespeare's Othello, reputation is a large importance used by all characters. Write in sentences, please. This is because at the time of the writing... And when the play is set, reputation was based on rank in society and what role one had in their job. This is of high importance as tragedy occurs in the play due to a disagreement over the appointing of Othello's lieutenant. Othello's reputation is a key issue in the play as he is a black man in a Venetian society. Critic Cowhig states he is an alien in a white society. This could show how segregated Othello feels for being judged simply by the colour of his skin. However, 
he has gained the position of general and been through many wars to achieve his place in society. This doesn't stop Brabantio, Desdemona's father, being repulsed that his daughter has run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou. By using this racist language, this draws attention to the colour of Othello's skin and suggests how those who were not used to seeing people of a different colour discriminated and hoped to draw shame on their reputation. By using the term such a thing as thou, this dehumanises Othello, suggesting he isn't worthy of being noticed as a man. A.C. Bradley stated Othello should have been tanned rather than black, as this would have allowed early audiences to accept Othello and not feel hatred against him from the start of the play. This, however, would take away the deep historical understanding that people with dark skin were looked down on because of the colour of their skin and would also remove the extreme issue of a white woman being uh, marrying an older black man. Othello's reputation is also marked in the play by one of, he thinks, his closest friends, Iago. Iago uses racist zoomorphic humour to tease Othello behind his back. I'm not sure about tease, is that strong enough? Speaking in verse. However, when praising Othello to his face, he speaks in prose. No, sadly, it's the other way around. This could show Iago's trickery of the commander and how he has two sides to his personality that he tries to separate from his reputation. Iago states in Act 1, Scene 1, an old black ram is tupping your white you. This is ironic of Iago, as Othello believes him to be honest Iago, and this crude statement at the very beginning of the play shows the audience Iago isn't who Othello believes him to be, and that he wants to destroy the commander's reputation. It would appear that Iago doesn't discriminate against Othello because of his race, however. He uses this at his advantage, to his advantage, to make Othello appear worse to others. The use of his race leads to the thought that he used black magic to trick Desdemona into loving him. This again causes harm to his reputation, as the colour black was associated with evil and impurity. Go on to explain the AO3 historic context with greater clarity then. Othello, however, protests his, this accusation, proving he's not willing to lose his reputation over something that's not true. Although Iago wants others to see him as being noble and trustworthy, he works to destroy the reputation of many characters around him, such as Othello, Desdemona and Cassios. He does this out of jealousy, as he believed he should have been Othello's lieutenant, not Cassio. Not great sentences. At the time of writing, a person's word was seen as the truth. I'd, I'd hope so now too. Therefore, if they were accused of being a liar, their words were automatically associated with the devil. This therefore shows Iago's strong-mindedness when stating to Othello that both Cassio and Desdemona were lying about their affair. Othello believes Iago's lies and regards his reputation higher than his wife's, eventually leading to both of their deaths. Is this perhaps too narrative in its approach? It is argued that there would be no Othello without Iago, cite the critic, as he simply draws out the negative thoughts he pushes to the back of his mind. However, this argument is criticised by Levis, who states that Othello is responsible for his own downfall, as his hamartia of jealousy and his hubris take over his mind. This leads to him destroying his own reputation, as he changes from a man he is of honesty and trust to an animal who trusts no one and turns on those who he loved the most. Reputation is also an important issue for the women in the play, as they are looked down on because of their gender. Women at the time were seen as being only one rank above animals and two below men. Not quite, 
uh, we might be getting to the reputation of women a bit late and not developing it far enough. They were seen as subservient, and if they stood up to a man, they could be harmed because of it. However, it is said that Shakespeare had an interest in women at the time of writing, as all three women in the play are modern for their time. This does, however, result in two out of the three of them being killed. Desdemona's reputation in the play reduces as she becomes linked to a black man, having her husband as one of her few allies. However, he also turns against her, resulting in her being both physically and metaphorically silenced due to her smothering. Not sure I follow. Amelia's reputation is also tarnished, firstly by being a woman, and secondly by her scheming husband, Iago. She, however, unlike Desdemona, stands up to her husband, explaining his wrongdoing and exposing him for lying to Othello. She states, "'Tis proper I obey him, but not now." This shows Amelia as a modern woman of her time, creating a difference between herself and Desdemona's potential passiveness. In conclusion, reputation at the time of writing was based heavily on both race and gender. However, with Shakespeare's writing, these areas can be overlooked and show modern characters of their time. Boundaries for this paper out of 60 meant that a 22 was needed for a D grade. This got a D grade with 24, where the C grade boundary was 27. The prior year, 2018's question was, explore how Shakespeare treats the theme of identity in Othello. You must relate your discussion to relevant contextual factors and ideas from your critical reading. So this is harking back to 2018 now, and I can't absolutely accurately remember the boundaries, but I reckon 38 out of 60 would likely have been a B, although it could have been an A. 38 was the, the A boundary for 2019. Uh, it did shift by one, I'm not sure. Um, so this could have been A grade. Uh, it's either A or B, I can't remember. I do remember this candidate got a B overall, and I know that their prose was B, if I remember rightly. 38 out of 60, 15 out of 21 for argument, close analysis and context, 10 out of 14 for other critical interpretations, 25 out of 35. This candidate was a dramatist. She's on stage in London these days. Uh, and I think her being a dramatist really shows in this response. The theme of identity. In Shakespeare's Othello, each character's identity and what defines them differs and contrasts, creating an interesting piece of theatre as the audience are drawn into the psychological complexity of each character. Othello's identity is largely reliant on his race, due to the racist stereotypes of the 16th century. That is, that is how other characters define him and st struggle to look past. Desdemona's identity largely hinges upon Othello, her husband, due to the limited role and status of women at the time, whilst Iago deceitfully seems to adopt two personalities, the Machiavellian villain and the obsequious servant. I'd argue that obsequious goes hand in hand with Machiavellian, otherwise the servant in appearance would be genuinely loyal, depending on whom he's speaking to. All the characters in the play, however, emphasise the importance of reputation as a part of their identity, and Shakespeare portrays how the loss of this can drive a person to commit terrible acts making the audience question whether placing so much emphasis on how you are perceived by others is really right. In the light of his white companions, Othello's identity is defined by his race. For example, rather than referring to him by his name, Othello is simply referred to as the Moor. 
are referring directly to the colour of his skin as a way of defining him. The racist attitudes of Elizabethan times mean that Othello experiences much prejudice because of his race, due to the fact that black people were viewed as of a lower status than white people, often working as slaves or entertainers. Also, the association of the colour black with the devil, witchcraft and negativity contributed to the racist view that the white characters display throughout the play. This can be seen through the use of imagery relating to dark and light, referring to negative and positive, that is used regarding Desdemona and Othello. For example, in Act 1, Scene 1, Iago exclaims that an old black ram is topping your white you. This zoomorphic representation of Othello relates the negative connotation of his black skin to the sexual connotation of topping and forcing the racial stereotype of black men being overly sexual, used once again late in the play when Othello is described as lascivious. That's been done well. Thus, excuse me, this compared with the positive connotations of white for Desdemona, connoting purity and innocence, strengthened by the youth connoted from you, create the negative image of Othello and his relationship with Desdemona due to the colour of his skin, which is the only thing people relate his identity to. It is clear during the play that the racist attitudes displayed toward him have created an insecurity within Othello when he feels unworthy and isolated and values himself and his identity less. Fintan O'Toole summarises how racist attitudes have infected Othello when he wrote, Racism is not just the context in which Othello lives. It has entered his mind and soul. This is an effective analysis of the ways in which racist attitudes have shaken and shaped Othello's own identity. However, O'Toole seems to criticise Othello in another work when he writes, he is manipulated by Iago, a man he didn't even trust enough to make him his lieutenant in the first place, without ever trying to ascertain facts for himself. Suspecting his wife, he fails to confront her or ask any of the other people who could tell him what's going on. I would disagree with this critical view on Othello's lack of communication with those around him, and I would argue that this stems from the racial isolation that he experiences, rather than a lack of intelligence, refuting critics well. In a similar way, Shakespeare presents Desdemona's identity as being reliant on one particular thing, rather than herself as a person. Desdemona's identity hinges on her husband, Othello. This would have been common portrayal in literature at the time, as wives were still legally property of their husbands. However, a 21st century audience may view this relationship in a more shocking way than a 16th century audience might. Because their identity is so reliant on Othello, who is uncommunicative with her, some critics have claimed she, Desdemona, is a passive character. For example, Jameson described her as having gentleness verging on passiveness. However, I would argue, refuting, refining the critic, that any passiveness is not a direct trait of her character, but rather what appears as a result of her identity being so tied up in her husband, who is uncommunicative, and therefore she is denied a voice to express her own part of identity, part of her own identity. This creates the picture that she is a one-dimensional character, as are all the women in the play, who each represent a one-dimensional aspect of womanhood. The romantic lover Desdemona, the practical realist Amelia, and the sex object Bianca. Well put. Desdemona's identity is also largely described by other people as being extremely positive. She is referred to as Jewel, an angel, relating her to something of a divine celestial being. 
This places incredibly high expectations on her, ones that are almost impossible to uphold and from which she will inevitably fall, meaning her identity that others have defined for her is lost and tarnished. Notice how synonymous the reputation and identity question year on year could be. That's what I mean by picking banks of quotations that overlap themes economically. You can use one for one or the other. As the most manipulative character in the play, Iago presents two identities throughout that he switches between depending on who he's talking to. Because of this, it's extremely apt and ironic that in Act 1, Scene 2, Iago swears by Janus, as Janus was the god of duality and had two faces in Roman mythology, reflecting the two identities Iago portrays in the play. That's very well done too. His contrasting identities are signposted to the audience through Shakespeare's effective use of verse and prose. When speaking to somebody of a higher status than himself, Iago speaks in verse. Really well done, unlike some of the muddling in some candidates. Blending in with the high status Venetian socialites. Brilliant. However, when he is discussing his vengeful plotting or expressing his misogynistic views toward women, he speaks in prose. This switch effectively signposts to the audience which villainous identity Iago is portraying. Brilliant. Another way Shakespeare does this is through his use of asides and soliloquies, during which Iago shows his plans for Othello's demise with the audience, shares his plans for Othello's demise with the audience, creating dramatic irony. Critic Sean McAvoy summarises the effect this has on an audience when he wrote, the audience become complicit in Iago's intentions and, like it or not, he is involved or they are involved in his vengeful plotting. In the light of this argument, some argue that it creates a sympathy for Othello as the audience have shared in his plans for revenge. O'Toole relates to this when he writes, Iago is as much a tragic figure as any of Shakespeare's protagonists. However, I would argue that rather than sympathy... He's refined, she's, this candidate is refining the point. A frustration is created among the audience as we are forced to witness the manipulation take place but are unable to do anything about it. Meaning the audience is constantly engaged throughout the play as we are wishing we could highlight Yargo's dual personality to Othello. Brilliant in terms of audience response. A dramatist, clearly, and it does well for it. All the characters place high value on reputation as part of their identity. This can be seen when Cassio exclaims, Reputation! Oh, I have lost my reputation! I have lost the immortal part of myself and what remains is bestial. I'm sick of the sound of my own voice on that now. The description of reputation as being the immortal part of a person shows it is of high value as it is the part of their identity that will live on forever. This description could also have connotations of reputation being like a person's soul and therefore giving it celestial importance. Once again, showing it is a major part of the character's identities in the play. This is further emphasised by the description of a man being bestial without, implying he is inhuman without his reputation, and the bestial imagery that is used prior to this conveys just how negative that is. In conclusion, Shakespeare treats the theme of identity in differing ways regarding the different characters in the play. However, all the characters placed a high emphasis on how reputation is a large part of their identities. 
For Othello, his identity being so closely regarded to his race is what brings about his downfall as he is not accepted in the harsh, economically driven and racist society of Venice, where Iago's dual personalities of manipulation thrive. This drama response was on the BA borderline. It might have crept into A, but it's definitely on the borderline. And this candidate was B overall. I think that long-winded as this may have been, this serves to illustrate the points I was making in episode 8, linked here, that you can go back to on the escalation of, we've not seen any E grades, just using a bit of critics gets you a D, starting to engage with evidence for those critics, gets you into C territory and starting to contrast. As you start to contrast and bring one critic against another and bring in evidence from elsewhere in the play and pit one against the other and evaluate them, you're moving up through C to B to A to A star. Equally, you will have seen some candidates performing well by bringing context in analytically and others at C or D shoehorning it in as an afterthought. Make sure that you integrate AO3 and 5 to the AO2 analysis and your core AO1 argument. The best answers integrate those things together fluidly. If you want to go back to socio historic context, linked here is episode 1. Episode 2 was Approaches. Episode 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 took you through Acts 1 to 5, respectively. Episode 8 was Socio... Uh, no, not socio historic Context. Episode 8 was Other Critics' Opinions. Exam prep was last episode, and you've got your exam examples here. If you are doing, as part of your prose unit, Handmaid's Tale, then this link will take you to my course on Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, 13 episodes long, socio-historic context, close analysis throughout, and arguments. Exam preparation, comparing with Frankenstein, and some exam examples like these. If you happen to be uh, an EDUCAS A-level film studies student as well, and perhaps you've just interested in it, given that we've been doing the drama here, you might want to look at some of my forthcoming episodes on the short film production coursework element of that course that I'll be doing soon. And beyond that, I'll be looking at the British and American film units, the global film, documentary, silent and experimental, if that's relevant to you. If not... Uh, then it only remains for me to wish you the very best of luck in your exams. I hope this has been useful. It doesn't come down to luck, so long as you have really put 100% into your revision and preparation. And if you know that you've put 100% in, then you can be satisfied with whatever the grade outcome is. Don't leave any gaps through lack of effort. Uh, remember, I can and I did. Keep telling yourself you can, keep putting the work in, and you will get the just fruition that's satisfying. Um, please, if this has been useful to you, hit subscribe if you've not yet done so already. Hit like, and the notification bell will warn you of forthcoming episodes and alert you first come first served if they're relevant to you. I don't know quite what yet. Thank you. Bye.